Hello, my name is Danny Mishura. I'll be performing 38 Pickup by Patrick F. McManus. Of all the firsts of a person's life, one that usually takes place sometime in the teenage years stands out above all others. It is the one that changes your life and introduces you to an experience more grand and wonderful and scarier, too, than you ever even imagined. Oh, it is a fearful and glorious and momentous occasion. The day you get your first driver's license. At least it was so for me. I can remember with crystalline clarity every little nuance of that steamy August day. For weeks I had practiced parallel parking the family car between two bales of hay in the field next to our farmhouse. Nevertheless, the very thought of having my driving skills put to the test had turned me into a nervous wreck, if for no other reason than the rarity of finding a parking space between two bales of hay. I memorized the entire booklet of driving rules. Not a great accomplishment, because there were a lot fewer rules in those days. Mostly, you had to make sure you knew the hand signals for turning left and right and braking. Hand signals were important, because most cars didn't have turn signals, and some didn't have brakes. <laughs> At least any of that worked all that well. What the hand signal for braking warned was, I am braking now, but don't expect the car actually to stop. You also had to show you recognized the shapes of highway signs. Knowing the shape of the stop sign was most important. Particularly if you couldn't read the word stop and were colorblind. <laughs> the frightening part of the experience, though, was demonstrating you knew how to drive to the satisfaction of the much feared driver's license inquisitor. <laughs> if I failed parallel parking, I'd probably be afoot the rest of my life. Night after night, I lay awake, worrying about the ordeal that loomed ahead. Parallel parking in the infernal driving test. The driver's license office wasn't too busy the day I showed up for my examination. The Inquisitor, a large, beefy man in cowboy boots, was leaned back in his seat with his feet propped up on his bare desk. He was reading the newspaper and smoking a cigar. He did not seem pleased at the interruption. I'm here for my driver's license exam, I said, my voice quaking only slightly. Why else would you show up on a day like this? Well, here's the written test. I finished the test and handed it in. The Inquisitor sped read it in one second. You passed. Congratulations. Now I suppose I have to take you out and see if you actually know how to drive a car. <laughs> Heaving a monstrous sigh and himself from the chair, he lumbered off down the hall with me following nervously but respectfully behind. I didn't want to do anything that would annoy the Inquisitor more than my mere existence already had. Suddenly, he stopped, turned, frowned, looked me up and down, and said, Aw, heck, son, you know how to drive. <laughs> then he plobbled back to his office and issued me my first driver's license. The long, dreaded ordeal had turned out to be much easier than I'd ever imagined. Thank you very much, sir. This is a very important day for me, and I much appreciate you expediting the whole process. I will endeavor to obey all the rules and work constantly to perfect my driving skills and beat it! <laughs> my mother was waiting for me outside in the car. I passed! Scoot over, I'll drive! While I waited for her laughter to subside, 
I began to get a sense that my prospects for tooling around in the family car were not such that I should hold my breath. Well, at least by this fall, I should be able to drive the car up into the mountains to go hunting. Oh, oh, <laughs> please stop. You're making my sides ache. The odds of me acquiring the vehicle by fall did not appear any better of the odds of my tooling. As I've often pointed out, the best kind of hunting vehicle is any kind of vehicle belonging to someone else. Wow, Fred, that was one rough patch back there. You wiped out your front bumper and tore off one of your doors. Anyway, as I was saying, the farmer turns the traveling salesman and... It is possible I developed this theory about best hunting vehicles from my very first such vehicle. A week or so after getting my license, I was helping a farmer repair his fence. He was called Freaky, although there was nothing at all odd about him except a name that sounded something like Freaky. I told Freaky of my sad plight, namely that even though I now had my driver's license, I would still have to two-wheel it up to my hunting grounds on my bike. A kindly, but famously tight-fisted man, Freaky sympathized with me. You know what? Since you're such a good-hearted lad to be out here helping me repair my fence, I might just do you a little favor. I thought you were paying me. Nope, your mother loaned you to me. <laughs> but about the favor, I got this old 38 pickup truck, and you can borrow it to go hunting. All you need to do is make sure the gas tank is full when you return it. Wow! That's great, Freaky! How could I ever repay you? Well, if you insist, you could all those 4,000 bales of hay out of the field and stack them in the barn. I wasn't insisting. It was worth a try. That really surprised me. Decent though he was, it was so unlike Freaky, as far as I knew, to give something for nothing. The only possible answer was... I had charmed him into it with the warmth and sparkle of my personality. <laughs> when I told Mom the good news, a sadness seemed to come over. Don't worry, Mom. I'll be real careful with the truck. It's not that. It's freaky. I hadn't realized he'd lost his mind. <laughs> freaky was as good as his work. When hunting season rolled around, the truck was practically mine. He even said I could keep it at my place. It was a powerful, 1938 Studebaker half-ton pickup. A two-wheel drive, but with the first gear so low, the truck could almost climb trees, and occasionally made the attempt. The truck was practically indestructible, at least much more so than I. Once, having whacked my head soundly against the seal ceiling beam, I came up with this really zany idea. Belts that would hold a person down on the seat and keep them from ricocheting about in the cab. <laughs> now that I had wheels, four instead of the usual two, my hunting took on a whole new aspect. By getting up at four in the morning, I could drive out to my favorite mountain, hunt for an hour or so, and still make it back in time for school. Not that that was high on my list of priority. Soon, desperate to get my first deer, I was now hunting four and five days a week, but with no more success than when I had only hunted weekends on my bike. One morning, toward the end of deer season, I was sure I finally had my buck. My practice was to park the truck at the bottom of the mountain and then walk up an old skid trail in the dark to get in a good position before daylight. A thick, noisy crust had formed on the snow, but I could walk quietly by following my tracks from the day before. 
I knew a big white tail buck hung out on this side of the mountain, and on this dark and icy morning, I sensed that he and I were about to converge. As I work my way up the skid trail, I suddenly heard this loud, startled snort from behind a patch of brush a dozen yards away. I froze which wasn't too difficult because I was already half frozen. It would be a good hour yet before it would be light enough to shoot, but the deer hadn't spooked. I knew he would have to make a terrible ruckus if he crashed off through the crusted snow, and I had heard nothing since that single snort. Silent minute after silent minute crept by, Scarcely breathing, I continued to freeze there on the snow-covered road. Numbness crept up my legs and bit by bit engulfed the entire lower half of my body. I sensed that major and valued portions of my autonomy were about to suffer frostbite. I breathed on my trigger finger to keep it limber. Yet only one part of me worked when dawn had last cracked. I wanted it to be that finger. Slowly, the darkness fades from the land. I waited for a chance for a clear view of the buck's only route of escape. Stiff with cold, I move like a frosted Frankenstein's monster toward the concealing patch of brush, my frozen pants crackling at every step. But still the buck didn't run. Closer and closer I crept. But the buck still didn't run. He never ran. The patch of brush was empty. Why hadn't I heard him bound off through the crusted snow? Because he hadn't bounded. He had slipped away by carefully stepping in his own previous tracks. <laughs> I did not brag to my friends about this little adventure. Me being outwitted by a simple-minded ruminant was not something I wished to share with them. Most of my other hunts in the year Freaky loaned me his pickup were not nearly so successful. By the end of deer season, I had practically come to think of the truck as my own. But I was by no means stingy with it. Sometimes I would even let Freaky borrow his truck, if he had some real need for it, of course. Much to my surprise, he had turned out to be such a generous and kindly man. I certainly owed him some consideration. After all, he had furnished me not only with the means of transporting myself into the mountains, but into a whole realm of myself I had not yet explored a place you can get only under the power of your first driver's license. And a vehicle that, no matter its condition, at least moves.